It's a new year and a new chance for you to make a fresh start with your compliance. For the next 31 days on the FCPA Compliance Report, we're going to be bringing you a daily tip, strategy, or idea that you can use to improve your program. Here's your host, Tom Fox, the Compliance Evangelist. This month's sponsor of 31 Days to a More Effective Compliance Program is Affiliated Monitors. Founded in 2004, Affiliated Monitors provides professional, independent, integrity monitoring and ethics and compliance assessments nationally and internationally and across almost all industries. With its knowledge of effective ethics and compliance programs and cultures, Affiliated Monitors is respected for its work as the corporate monitor on matters ranging from multinational corporations to small and mid-sized companies and even individuals. Having served in over 750 monitorships, no one has more experience as an independent monitor than the team at Affiliated Monitors. For more information on how an independent monitor can help improve your company's ethics and compliance program, visit this month's sponsor, Affiliated Monitors, at www.affiliatedmonitors.com. What are the obligations of a board regarding the FCPA? Are the obligations of the audit committee under the FCPA at odds with the director's prudent discharge of duties to shareholders? What do the words prudent discharge mean, even though they do not appear in the FCPA? Answering these questions and perhaps others were Jeff Kaplan and Rebecca Walker in a webinar entitled, Reporting to the Board on Your Compliance Program. Kaplan pointed to the U.S. Sentencing Guidelines, which I discussed in Day 1, a 30 Days to a Better Board. And the questions posed by the Sentencing Guidelines are, do the directors exercise independent review of a company's compliance program? And two, are the directors provided with sufficient information to enable the exercise of independent judgment? Obviously, in the role of best practices, we do have the Delaware case law for oversight. But in addition to the two cases I named yesterday, the Walt Disney case draws the principle out that directors should follow the best practices in the areas of ethics and compliance. Melissa Aguilar, writing in Compliance Week, noted that Companies which don't have the incentive to spend resources or take a rigorous approach to their anti-compliance program often can get themselves in trouble. And there must be written records demonstrating the audit committee and indeed the entire board has asked questions and received answers to anti-corruption compliance issues. This is one of the indicia of demonstrating fulfillment of prudent discharge. One of the areas that a company's board can do this is in the specific area of monitoring, management, and compliance. Clearly, a business must be managed uh, under the direction of the board. The board's role is not to manage the company, but to oversee and monitor the management of the company. The board of directors has the responsibility to fulfill the role of strategic and business advisor to the management of the company. In addition, a board has the role of monitoring the performance of the company and management, specifically including compliance. This is using the company's customary economic metrics and also by overseeing compliance with applicable laws and regulations. While the board is not responsible for the auditing or ferreting out of compliance problems, it certainly is responsible for determining that the company has an appropriate system of internal controls. The board should also monitor company compliance programs and practices that address legal compliance, government relations, and matters affecting public perception and reputation of the company. These final two are becoming more and more important. And if you think about any of the recent corporate scandals or the largest of the recent corporate scandals, none of which involved FCPA or anti-bribery corruption compliance, you'll see that it was the public perception and reputational damages which damaged the company, which caused the biggest problems. Obviously, Wells Fargo falls into that category. Volkswagen falls into that category. So uh, it is the reputation and public perception now that may be as important for a board 
to manage, or at least manage management's management, managing of those issues. Every company should ensure that its conduct, it conducts appropriate compliance training for employees and conducts regular compliance assessments. Finally, a board must take appropriate action if and, become, if and when it becomes aware of a material problem that it believes management is not handling. To do all of this, a board really needs to focus on the business judgment rule, which we talked about in day one, but also around the process that a board should go through. And it is this process which protects the board of directors through the business judgment rule. A board of directors must actively participate in the decision-making process and seek to inform itself of all relevant facts when considering a proposed board action or a compliance program, program's effectiveness. The most important action a director can take when faced with a business decision is to be actively engaged in that decision-making process. When <clears throat> the directors take little or no action, they risk losing the protection of the business judgment rule because they are not exercising their prudent discharge of their duties. Directors that implement policies and procedures to ensure that the requirements of the business judgment rule are met will be generally protected from the liability from liability for their decisions. In the FCPA world, in greater anti-corruption compliance world, this is certainly not insignificant. If you think about this in the context of significant transactions, boards should seek to ensure that certain processes are built in to the record to show that the board has actively engaged in prudent discharge. Certainly, if a company is opening a uh, new business unit, bringing in uh, joint venture partners, or other strategic partnerships, uh, this should be considered. Directors should, among other things, adhere to the process which allows them to be informed in accordance with the requirements of not only the FCPA, but also their general duty of good care, and document the board's good faith efforts to exercise its business judgment. Under appropriate circumstances, the board can form a committee of independent directors to act on behalf of the board, hire a professional uh, advisor to issue a fairness opinion, or legal counsel to issue a legal opinion, or bring in other professionals as necessary to advise the board. An important prote- uh, exception to the protection of the business judgment rule is the failure to satisfy the duty of oversight by failing to prevent corporate wrongdoing. The business judgment rule usually does not apply to failure to protect and prevent cases since they are not challenging a decision or action of the board but instead are a claim based on the failure of the board to take action. Failure of directors to prevent misstatements and financial statements also through violations of the FCPA or other anti-corruption compliance laws can be a key component of this and, depending on the facts, may not be covered by the business judgment rule. The key in this, these situations are Did the directors have a good faith duty to consciously satisfy themselves that the company had placed effective internal controls, monitoring, and reporting systems in place specifically designed to protect, excuse me, to defend, detect, and prevent the illegal conduct? So from that, you can clearly see the further expansion of the legal obligations that I set forth yesterday in day one. So what are the three key takeaways? Well, the first one is you have to understand the phrase prudent discharge of duties in and of itself. What does that mean and what are you engaging in this? Number two, do you have a specific board committee which is looking at compliance? We're going to talk about the details of that later in a subsequent podcast, but it's an important first step. And finally, number three, are you actively engaged? 
a company must be, a board of directors must be actively engaged, and there must be documented evidence that that active engagement has gone forward. So we spent a couple of days talking about the legal requirements for the board of directors and how those legal requirements might play out in various uh, scenarios. The obligations that a board has are going to be evolving, and as increased reputational risks bring greater damage to corporations who do not manage these, I think you're going to see additional shareholder uh, activity and additional shareholder awards going forward. Derivative action. Thank you for listening to this episode of 31 Days to a More Effective Compliance Program, where in the month of August, we're going to take a look at the role of the Board of Directors in a Best Practices Compliance Program. Once again, thanks to our sponsor, Affiliated Monitors, for sponsoring this month's series. This production of 31 Days to a More Effective Compliance Program is a special production of the Compliance Podcast Network. I hope you will join me again tomorrow.